So I'm thinking of things that I could do besides freelance work for income the other day. Let's say I wanted to make $900 a month just to start out, just something small, work your way up, whatever. 30 days on average. So that'd be $30 a day, but I would need to make $40 a day because on top of that, I'm going to say $10 for advertising. So $40 a day for 30 days. So some of the things that I already have on hand to start testing this out today. The book. Now the commission on that is like, we'll just say $5 for the book that I have. However many I have to sell that day. What is it? Six? Yeah. So I'd have to sell six books a day. It doesn't seem too crazy to try and sell six books a day. I just really like to try to get away from freelancing. And also, I don't want to freelance. See? I've done freelancing over the past year, mainly because I can build websites. One, it's always a struggle to get what it's worth, is what I've learned. And two, that ends up being what you do. Freelancing is always you do that first because that's what you're getting paid for. So I need to switch gears and find ways to get paid for things I want to do. With the book and finding people that can relate to it, makes me think of some of the other stuff I do, like drawings. Like, what are some things that can earn money in the background while still doing what I want to do? And also just thinking differently rather than everybody come to my site and get things, whereas put it in other places where people can relate to it. That's where I'm at. Still figuring that out. That was basically me thinking out loud, trying to figure out what the best answer is. I don't know yet. Maybe experimenting on more than one place or one medium at one time is what I'm going to try and do first, I think. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. Now, back in season two, one of the people I met ran a coffee shop in town here. It was called Mother Fools. There was an art installation there in the fall, and the artist that was doing it heard the podcast and reached out to me and asked if I would stop by to check it out. Uh, my name is Bradley Flora, and I'm an artist. We ended up sitting down to talk, and he told me about how he's been expanding on what he's been doing, photography, and moving into painting. And I want to mention one more thing. I noticed while editing this interview, he has this dry wit that I picked up on even more when I went back to edit this interview, so I found that pretty entertaining. You originally were a photographer, weren't you? I still, I still am a photographer. Right. I'm, I'm on hiatus right now. You know, I took a picture yesterday. Uh, uh -huh. It was a sunset. I feel like I'm the first person to ever do that. <sighs> um, but I mean, I think that's part of it is that, you know, I want to say something with my art, and it's really hard to do that with photography because I like to operate in a, as a photojournalist. I mean, that's, I'm trained to speak truth with my art. I'm actually a journalism school dropout. So it's like I still manage to get good enough at photography and take it seriously enough to operate as a photojournalist for an independent newspaper in Colorado. At no point since then have I wanted to try to photoshop my work or to manipulate the reality that I see. I always want to just, you know, even when I go take a landscape picture, only within the last year have I even felt comfortable kind of like pushing a twig out of the way if I want to get the view better. Like really it's more like that twig is part of the composition. But the flip side to that is that with acrylic, and painting and drawing, it's all staged. It all comes from the imagination to one degree or another. Um, I'm inspired by, um, we'll have to double check this name, but it's Albert Camus. I think he's the, the um, he owned the, the lithographic company, but he made the book of lithographs that was about the Civil War. Field sketch artists during the Civil War have always been really inspiring to me too, of, of working accurately and efficiently. And I've kind of combined that with what I've reacted against with the photojournalism to produce this show where I'm seeing truth, but I'm allowing myself to integrate my opinion into it. Because with photojournalism, you know, opinion is biased and that's, that's something that's really toxic to uh, good journalism. How did you get started with doing the acrylics? Taking pictures during that time, using Kodak Insta cameras and carrying them with my snowboard. You know, that evolved to me working at an art store in Driggs, Idaho. Oh. which is uh, on the western slope of the Tetons. And the art store owner was basically like, you're running the shop and you're allowed to use any art supplies you want, like learn Photoshop on your free time, make art, print art. And his inspiration really got me to think about photography outside of the frame and ways to display it that were more alternative. And I have to be honest, I don't know if I've ever really produced anything that's 100% satisfactory to me. But as I kept pushing the boundaries of how to show my photography, I started using acrylic as a medium to frame it. 
so clear ac acrylic pores. I had some success, but generally I was a little impatient. Um, I'm, I'm so, I think one of the fun things about this show is this is the first time I've really produced work where I slow down and actually do something right, okay. if that makes any sense. I think I'm finally old enough to be mature and not, not just be like splashing paint Pollock style on the yeah. canvas. How would you describe the style that you are currently doing? When I moved back to Colorado, I went to a non-accredited art school that taught art in a uh, narrative impressionist style. The painting of the homeless guy holding the, the uh, Goya master copy, those are narrative impressionist styles as taught by my teacher, Brett Andrus of the Modbo. I don't do what he does, okay. <laughs> you know, and, and I, kind of, I kind of am only starting to come full circle and his, you know, his influence continues to trickle in. I mean, he was such a smart teacher that it's, you know, eight or nine, ten, or ten years since I've actually, you know, actually worked with him. I'm still evolving as an artist from his influence. And I was really lucky with this show to have a chance to kind of work, to find the threads of the work that I wanted to produce and follow them. The, the painting with the power plant and the buffalo is an example of that where I started it and it sat for almost four months before I painted it on it again. Hmm. So I painted on it for two days and then I just sat and looked at it and it was the power plant was vertical. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. And it took a while to find that thread and to realize that uh, I wanted that painting to be about the American dream and uh, colonialism and you know the, the death of uh, you know the great bison herds in the 19th century. I mean, it, but it took me four months to figure out that that was what that painting was about. And in that process, how far back does all the work that's in the showing that you have right now go? It's all new this year. The first painting I finished when I moved to Wisconsin is not in the show, and that was finished on Thanksgiving Day. It's on a vinyl table, mm -hmm. and the acrylic varnish is reacting with the vinyl, and it's not drying. Mm -hmm. So it's actually like sticky and wet one year later, which really? is actually, yeah, it's, it sits in the garage. That's it's, odd for acrylic. It's known that acrylic and vinyl react poorly. I just didn't know it at the time. I didn't know that. So it's known to other people. I had no clue. <laughs> yeah, I have a plan for that piece. So it's like mm -hmm. now that it's ruined, it's like I can fix it and play with it. That was the first one, and then I kind of went from there. Kind of like how you're glad that it was ruined. Because you're like, now I can do something else with it. Well, I mean, I'm glad that it's ruined because I'm secure in the fact that I still had a show that was successful. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the show went up. Knock on wood, <laughs> you know, nothing's dropped. I mean, you make art and no one gets hurt. What else do you want, right? I moved out here because I was taking care of uh, my uncle who had a degenerative brain disease. He died in May of 2018 oh, and sure. thank you. It was a... Uh, a five-year terminal diagnosis. So we knew it was coming and they, they asked me to come out to help so that so that he could stay at home. And through that process of like moving to a new place and not having friends and to be honest, I'm both really outgoing and like really uh, unaware of my own social awkwardness. So I do a really good job of making friends and losing them really quick. You know, as I continue to live here and make friends, I realized that the, the winter of last year when my uncle was at his most sick and I was at my most lonely was traumatic. And making art that helped me heal from some of those traumas and, and other people's traumas too, because I definitely got myself into situations where I was triggering other people and I didn't even realize it. Like, it's the kind of situation where, you know, if we go look at the paintings out there, there's like, it's like they're pages of my journal where I'm actually actively expressing how it felt to be in those moments. You were doing those while you were taking care of your uncle, so I assume you were creating the artwork in his home like during the free time or like while he was resting? Yeah, um, my, my uncle's name is Tony Zaluka and he, uh, he got his PhD at uh, UW-Madison um, in anthropology. He was an eth a paleo-ethnobotanist. In the world is that? I have no idea what that means. Well, he, he actually analyzed charcoal fragments to determine what kind of tree it was. That was his specialty. Oh, wow. And his wife was Peggy Flora Zaluka, who's a professional watercolor artist. She has an art studio in the house, and she's really supportive of me making art. One of the things I'm excited about moving forward is continuing to study with her. She's, she's really talented and wise. <laughs> I mean, half of the show, um, when you look at what's good and right with the show, at least half of it is just like pure influence from, from Peggy. She's really taught me a lot about color theory allowed me to take over a room and set up an art studio. We put plastic on all the walls and cardboard on the floor. And Are you that messy? Yeah, yeah. So there's the painting in the other room. I think it's called When Expectations Outweigh Benefits or something like that. And it's, it's a non-representational abstract piece that 
is a perfect example of how messy I can be. Okay. Because when you look at it, there's a lot of um, acrylic pores and stuff going on there where it just drips off the side. You can see accidental marks because I wasn't paying attention and my brush stroke was hitting it. I didn't notice it until after the work was, you know, quote unquote done. Subconsciously, that was integrated into the whole and the harmony. So as I'm finishing up the other marks, I'm taking in that accidental mark into account. So when the mm -hmm. whole painting was finished and then I found this, you know, it's, it's on a piece of, um, it's on a flat black plane and there's like a little white dash. Yeah. It's on one of the black and white paintings. And, and you'll see this little white mark and if you look above it, there's all these white brush strokes. So it almost looks like I did the white brush strokes and then I kind of pulled away from the canvas. It must have been like four in the morning and I wasn't paying close attention. I just, I just dabbed it. That integrated into the harmony of the painting and I, part of the process of learning how not to ruin paintings is making sure that I don't go back and touch it once it's considered done. Yeah. And so that's why I left that brush mark on there, you know, like I knew it was there in, in September when the painting's done and I'm getting ready to hang the show and it's like, man, no one's going to see that. Right. I mean, literally, I don't think anyone would know it was there or see it as a huge mistake unless I point it out. I was going to say that exact same thing. You basically said I have to stop working on it or else you could go on forever. And there, it's like there's the voice in my head and it's, it's sort of the cumulative voices of all the wise women in my life that are like, don't touch it anymore, Bradley. <laughs> Time to stop, Bradley. And I regret every time I don't listen to that voice. <laughs> There's always the other test too, which is, I like to call it the day after test. Yeah. So you stop and you go, okay, I'm done with it. And then like, look at it 12 hours later and then go, okay, am I really done? Am I happy with this? Or at least that's what's worked for me. I'll find out that half of the time it's like, oh yeah, no, that's, that's okay. It's, mm. I'm happy with that. It was an artist listen, so it was like an artist talk, but opposite. Yeah, explain that to me. You know, it's just a rebranded academic critique. I, I created an opening for people to tell me what my art meant to them. And that's where I started because this was a show that focused on non-binary social justice issues. Mm -hmm. So my position of privilege as a white male comes from of focusing on these issues and wanting to make art that open discussion about specific issues where each painting to one degree or another is about a different issue that is important to me, I don't think I get to have the definitive say of what that means. Mm -hmm. And so when the opportunity came to have an event and to have an artist talk, it became really clear to me that I didn't want to tell other people what this artwork meant. I get that because yeah. it's, you don't want to ruin it for him. Like if it does mean something to him, you don't want to turn around and go, no, that's not what that means. I mean, that was, that was certainly the part of the point of the event, but you know, talking about the, um, the painting with the power plant, the, it's called the portrait of the Martin Drake power plant. I mean, geez, I don't even really want to talk about this in detail because it's not even a fun topic, but basically <laughs> all the Buffalo got wiped out and it's fucked up. And, but that's, that's like, I live on stolen land. No. And I'm talking about it as if I have a right to say this is wrong, but all I'm doing is making something, I'm making beautiful art about it and trying to sell it, yeah. you know? And so what does that mean to the Ho-Chunk? Well, actually, I don't know. They didn't respond to my emails, but... Oh, you actually contacted them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I basically said, if you guys don't like this painting, you know, this is what this painting's about. If you don't like it, please let me know. I'll paint over it. Oh. It won't be in the show. Although I think I said that like the day before the show, so... You know, it would have been like this big performance art piece where like I come in with a bucket of paint and like paint over it, like vandalize your you own know, work, like in the in the in the coffee shop. But that's the thing is their opinion on this is a lot more valid than mine because we're all living with the history, but the, the pain for them is much more raw. What are some of the methods that you use to actually get yourself out there and sell your work? How, how do you sell the work? It comes down to intent. I've produced a body of work that's like every single image I chose, I did, um, you know, 15 four by six beautiful photographs. I picked my 15 most beautiful photographs, the ones that are most likely to sell. I painted them with a clear acrylic. I made them as clean as possible. And I did it all for like $3 an image. So when it came down to it, I could sell them for, I think I priced them at $20 each. And by the end of the show, I had sold all of them. So I took that model the next year and I was like, okay, I did that. Now I'm gonna produce work that says something. I didn't sell a thing. 
So when I say it comes down to intent, yeah. it's a little bit more about like, do I have the skills to match my vision? And is my vision driven by that intention? And I think that has been a bit of a surprise. I really didn't produce this show to be something that people would want to buy and take into their homes. I really was thinking this is a coffee shop. I want to make artwork that stimulates discussion and that creates an interesting event and says what I want to say. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm looking on it from the back end with hindsight. Um, in reality, it was more like I need to produce this type of work or I'm going to go crazy. You know, like I need to I need to explore my own my own challenges and talk about my own things. If we're going to be really honest, I think one of the best ways to sell your artwork is to produce artwork from your heart and then um, start bribing your family members to buy it. <laughs> I didn't say it would be financially sustainable. A determinant factor in what type of art you produce, it skews the type of art you make. You know, like I'm literally looking at my November budget and I'm saying like, oh good, I'm glad I sold a painting. Yeah. Now I have the ability to eat. You know, now I don't have to go work over as a dishwasher. I mean, you'd be surprised that like having art skills and no art degree really limits what you can do. Yes. Um, which isn't to say that I'm not, I'm not putting food on my table. I think living in a capitalist economy where market forces influence our subconscious skews the type of work we make in a toxic way. So when you ask what's the, what's the best way to be selling art, I'm not sure that art should be sold. I'm really happy to have the show. I'm really excited that pieces have sold. I would seriously consider giving away every single painting in the show if I thought it would help somebody. Making something from the heart helps yourself. Making something from the heart that helps someone else exponentially compounds that healing. Mm -hmm. And art that is about healing is the best kind of art. There's like the series of paintings of people holding signs. And in both cases, they're, they're homeless men. And in one of them, I'm calling it a self-portrait. That's literally a small bit of commentary on my own experience with avoiding homelessness and wanting to make artwork that's just a little bit expressing gratitude for, for kind of having survived some close calls with that type of, type of experience. But it's also more multifaceted. I'm calling it a self-portrait because it's an example of taking something really serious and presenting it to the world, and uh, which is a, in this case, a master copy of Francisco Goya's famous painting uh, from the early 19th century, the 3rd of May, which is about reprisals against Spanish revolutionaries. And I don't even know if his first name is Francisco. I may have gotten that wrong. Anyway, <laughs> it's Goya, just G-O-Y-A, Google it. You're holding it up to the world like it's something serious, and if the world doesn't respond in a positive way, you're left emotionally bereft. This particular piece was done with a model. I met, I met a homeless guy that I kind of became friends with while he was in my neighborhood. And after I knew that uh, it was okay to do this on his end, I hired him for a dollar a minute to pose for me. Mm. And so, you know, I gave him 20 bucks and for 20 minutes he held his sign, not facing the road, but facing me. And I sat and I drew him. This painting was the pose that he held. There's all this interesting symbolism people are saying of like, what does this line mean? Or what is this stuff? And I was like, oh, that was me trying to draw a jacket. <laughs> you know, I mean. So when I talk about the meaning of this painting, I don't necessarily have that at the beginning. It's more like I want to take this moment that I drew and I like the idea of putting a famous painting in it, what painting fits, and you kind of make decisions intuitively about what clicks and you feel the puzzle pieces click together and then you make the artwork and at the end you start trying to say smart stuff about it so people think you're smarter. So when it comes to selling your work over the long run, uh, don't admit that you're not as smart as you're not really are. To see Bradley's work and learn more about what he does and his paintings and photography, you can go to his website at bradleyflora.com. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to the show at my website, americanbandito.com, where you can also read my daily comic blog. The music for the show is composed by my band Lorenzo's Music, and our recent release, Romcom Mixtape, is available now anywhere you stream music, or you can go to lorenzosmusic.com and download it for free. 
Next time on the show, I meet two artists that work at a library who decided to promote culture with their own podcast. So until next time, so long.